All right, so here we are, Chapter 7, Part 3. When we left off, remember, Lily and Zach are on the honey wagon together, and they're driving across the county so that they can get some honey off of Mr. Clayton Forest land. Um, Clayton Forest is a lawyer in town, and he sells some of August honey on consignment. So remember, consignment was a word that um, you might not have known yesterday, so if you don't know it, you should have written it down in your exit slip and uh, look it up to see what it means. Um, they were, so Lily and Zach were in the car together and there was cotton, uh, floating along the road. And she says for all the life of her, it looked just like snow. And she starts imagining a snowball fight with her and Zach. Um, and she's kind of had quite a few mood changes so far. She's gone from hot to shivering to, um, acting like she's angry at Zach. Uh, and then they, started going over all the bumps and started laughing hysterically. Um, so she's gone through quite a few different moods right now. Um, and when we left off, she was saying that she was conscious of Zach's breathing. Um, it was foolish to think some things were beyond happening, even being attracted to Negroes. I'd honestly thought such a thing couldn't happen. The way water could not run uphill or salt could not taste sweet, a law of nature. Maybe it was a simple matter of being attracted to what I couldn't have. Or maybe desire kicked in when it pleased without noticing the rules we lived and died by. You gotta imagine what's never been, Zach had said. He stopped the honey wagon beside a cluster of 20 hives tucked in a thicket of trees where the bees could have shade in the summer and shelter from the wind through the winter. Bees were more fragile than I ever imagined. If it wasn't mites ruining them, it was pesticides or terrible weather. He climbed out and dragged a load of equipment off the back of the truck, helmets, extra supers, fresh brood frames, and the smoker, which he handed to me to light. I moved through camphor weed and wild azalea, stepping over fire ant mounds and swinging the smoker when he lifted the lids off the hives and peered inside, looking for capped frames. He moved like a person with genuine love of bees. I could not believe how gentle and soft-hearted he could be. One of the frames he lifted out leaked honey the color of plums. It's purple, I said. When the weather turns hot and the flowers dry up, the bees start sucking elderberry and makes a purple honey. People will pay two dollars a jar for purple honey. He dipped his finger into the comb and, lifting my veil, brought it close to my lips. I opened my mouth, let his finger slide in, sucking it clean. The sheerest smile brushed his lips and heat rushed up my body, he bent toward me. I wanted him to lift back my veil and kiss me. And I knew he wanted to do it too, by the way he fixed his eyes on mine. We stayed like that while bees swirled around our heads with a sound like sizzling bacon, a sound that no longer registered as danger. Danger, I realized, was a thing he got used to. But instead of kissing me, he turned to the next hive and went right on back with his work. The smoker had gone out. I followed behind him, and neither one of us spoke. We stacked the filled supers onto the truck like the cat had our tongues, and neither of us said a word till we were back in the honey truck, passing the city limit sign. Turbron, population 6,502, home of Williford Merchant. Who is Williford Merchant, I said, desperate to break the silence and get things back to normal. You mean you've never heard of Wilford Marchant, he said. She's only the world-famous writer who wrote three Pulitzer Prize books about the deciduous trees of South Carolina. I giggled. They didn't win any Pulitzer Prizes. You better shut your mouth, because in Turberon, Wilford Marchant's books are way up there with the Bible. We even have an official Wilford Marchant Day every year, and the schools hold tree-planting ceremonies. She always comes wearing a big straw hat and carrying a basket of rose petals, which she tosses to the children. She does not, I said. Oh, yes, Miss Willie is very weird. Deciduous trees are an interesting topic, I guess, but I myself would rather write about people. Ah, that's right, I forgot, he said. You're planning on being a writer, you and Miss Willie. You act like you don't believe I can do it. I didn't say that. You implied it. What are you talking about? I did not. I turned to concentrate on things beyond the window. The Masonic Lodge, hot by used cars, the Firestone Tire Store. 
Zach braked at a stop sign next to the Dixie Cafe, which sat practically in the front yard of Tri-County Livestock Company. And for some reason, this made me furious. What I wanted to know was how people ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner with the smell of cows, and worse, overwhelming their nose buds. I wanted to scream out the window, eat your damn breakfast grits somewhere else, why don't you? There's cow shit in the air. The way people live their lives, settling for grits and cow shit made me sick. My eyes stung all around the sockets. Zach crossed the intersection. I could feel his eyes bore onto the back of my head. You mad at me, he said. I meant to say, yes, I most certainly am because you think I will never amount to anything. But what came out of my mouth was something else and it was embarrassingly stupid. I will never throw rose petals to anybody, I said. And then I broke down, the kind of crying where you're sucking air and making heaving sounds like a person drowning. Zach pulled over on the side of the road, saying, Holy moly, what's the matter? He wrapped one arm around me and pulled me across the seat to him. I'd thought the whole thing was about my lost future, the one Mrs. Henry encouraged me to believe in, by plying me with books and summer reading lists and big talk about scholarships to Columbia College. But sitting there close to Zach, I knew I was crying because he had that one-sided dimple that I loved. Because every time I looked at him, I got a hot, funny feeling that circulated from my waist to my kneecaps. Because I'd been going along, being my normal girl self, and the next thing I knew, I'd pass through a membrane into a place of desperation. I was crying, I realized, for Zach. I laid my head on his shoulder and wondered how he could stand me. In one short morning, I had exhibited insane laughter, hidden lust, hissy behavior, self-pity, and hysterical crying. If I'd been trying to show him my worst sides, I could not have done a better job than this. He gave me a squeeze and spoke into my hair. It's going to be all right. You're going to be one fine writer one day. I saw him glance behind us, then across the road. Now you go back on over to your side of the truck and wipe your face, he said, and handed me a floor rag that smelled like gasoline. When we got to the honey house, it was deserted except for Rosaline, who was gathering up her clothes so she could move up into May's room. I'd been gone two slim hours and our whole living arrangement had been overturned. How come you get to sleep over there, I asked her. Because May gets scared at night by herself. Rosaline was going to sleep in the extra twin bed, get the bottom drawer of May's dresser for her stuff, and have the bathroom at her fingertips. I can't believe you're leaving me over here all by myself, I cried. Zach grabbed the hand truck and wheeled it out as fast as he could to start unloading the supers from the honey wagon. I think he'd had enough female emotion for the time being. I'm not leaving you. I'm getting a mattress, she said, and dropped her toothbrush and the red rose snuff into her pocket. I crossed my arms over my blouse that was still damp from all the crying I'd been doing. Fine then, go on. I don't care. Lily, that cot is bad on my back. And if you ain't noticed, the legs on it are all bent out of whack now. Another week and it's going to collapse on the floor. You'll be fine without me. My chest closed up. Fine without her. Was she out of her mind? I don't want to wake up from the dream world, I said. And mid-sentence, my voice cracked. And the words twisted and turned in my mouth. She sat on the cot, the cot I now hated with a passion because it had driven her to May's room. She pulled me down beside her. I know you don't, but I'll be here when you do. I might sleep up there in May's room, but I'm not going anywhere. She patted my knee like old times. She patted, and neither of us said anything. We could have been back in the policeman's car riding to jail for how I felt, like I would not exist without her patting hand. I followed Rosalind as she carried her few things over to the pink house, intending to inspect her new room. We climbed the steps onto the screen porch. August sat on the porch swing that was suspended from two chains on the ceiling. She was rocking back and forth, having her orangeade break and reading her new book, which she'd got from the bookmobile. I turned my head to read the title, Jane Eyre. May was on the other side of the porch, running clothes through the rubber rollers on the ringer washing machine. A brand new pink Lady Kenmore, which they kept out on the porch because there was no room in the kitchen. In television commercials, the woman who worked the Lady Kenmore wore an evening gown and seemed to be enjoying herself. May just looked hot and tired. She smiled as Rosaline went by with her things. So think about that. 
what is May doing out on the porch? The Lady Kenmore. It's a washing machine. So they're keeping the washing machine out on the porch because there's no room for it in the kitchen. So back in this time, there was no such thing, or most people anyways, didn't have a laundry room, which now pretty much all of our houses have, right? But she's doing it out on the porch, and she is the one who has to work it. It's not just a plug in and walk away and come back and it's done. No, she has to work the washing machine. Are you okay with Rosalind moving over here? August said, propping the book on her stomach. She took a sip of her drink, then ran her hand across the cold moisture on the glass and pressed her palm to the front of her neck. I guess so. May will sleep better with Rosalind in there, she said. Won't you, May? I glanced over at May, but she didn't seem to hear over the washer. Suddenly, the last thing I wanted was to follow Rosalind and watch her tuck her clothes into May's dresser. I looked at August's book. What are you reading about? I asked, thinking I was making casual conversation. But boy, was I wrong. It's about a girl whose mother died when she was little, she said. Then she looked at me in a way that made my stomach tip over, the same way it tipped over when she'd told me about Beatrix. What happens to the girl, I asked, trying to make my voice steady. I've only just started the book, she said. Right now, she's just feeling sad and lost. Lost and sad, sorry. I turned and looked out toward the garden, where June and Neil were picking tomatoes. I stared at them while the crank on the washer squealed. I could hear the clothes falling into the basin behind the rollers. She knows, I thought. She knows who I am. I stretched out my arms like I was pushing back invisible walls of air and looking down caught sight of my shadow on the floor. The skinny girl with wild hair curling up in the humidity with her arms flung out and her palms erect like she was trying to stop traffic in both directions. I wanted to bend down and kiss her for how small and determined she looked. When I glanced back at August, she was still staring at me like she expected me to say something. Well, I guess I'll go see Rosaline's new bed, I said. August picked up her book, and that was that. The moment passed, and so did the feeling that she knew who I was. I mean, it didn't make sense. How could August Boatwright know anything about me? It was around this time that June and Neil started a first-class fight out there in the tomato garden. June shouted something, and he shouted back. Uh-oh, said August. She put down the book and stood up. Why can't you just let it be, yelled June. Why does it always come back to this? Get this through your head. I am not getting married. Not yesterday, not today, not next year. What are you scared of, Neil said. For your information, I'm not scared of anything. Well, then, you're the most selfish bitch I ever met, he said, and started walking toward his car. Oh, Lord, said August under her breath. How dare you call me that, said June. You come back here. Don't you walk off when I'm talking to you. Neil kept right on walking. Didn't look over his shoulder once. Zack, I noticed, had stopped loading supers into the hand truck and watched, shaking his head like he couldn't believe he was witnessing another scene where people's worst sides come out. If you leave now, don't plan on coming back, she yelled. Neil climbed into his car and suddenly June came running with tomatoes in her hands. She reared back and threw one, splat, right onto the windshield. The second one landed on the door handle. Don't you come back, she yelled as Neil drove off, trailing tomato juice. May sank down onto the floor, crying and looking so hurt inside I could almost see soft red places up under her rib bones. August and I walked her out to the wall, and for the umpteenth time she wrote June and Neil on a scrap of paper and wedged it between the rocks. And that's where we'll stop for today.